going on in the city of Pittsburgh. In the 1980s, we had over 1.1 million people. Today, we have a little over uh, 300,000. Uh, communities I've worked in over the past 30 years, for example, one of the communities I've worked in, Homewood, it had uh, 30,000 people, and today it has 6,442 people. So we've hollowed out. And so we've had a uh, great, what we call, rebound as a rust belt to a brain belt, but the people coming into our city on every stage for two years or less. And so when we look at the work we've been doing with the city of Pittsburgh, it's equity indicator work, we began to explore over the last two years when they did their analysis, they scored a 55. And so they were deeply disturbed by that analysis and began to look more deeply at what is the root reason for uh, the low score and how can they uh, make some pivots in an organizational way that changes the outcomes that they're looking at with regards to maintaining time. Norman spoke around 500,000 students that graduated this year in Pennsylvania. In the 10 county region around the city of Pittsburgh, we graduate 40,000 people a year from colleges, 20,000 of them leave the day after graduation. So we also have a brain drain. And so our complete counts uh, work has been similar to Norman's analysis and set me one a little bit deeper. Um, what we tried to do is we were broken into subcommittees and we looked at um, how could we go deeper with the opposed uh, process, the proposed process, and then examine how can it be more catalytic. For example, if we're going to train people in what I would call a seasonal work, right? This seasonal work is every 10 years, for example, but it's episodal. Norman spoke to every six months, there's an election. And in many ways, we've created a transactional process by which we need transformational activity in. If you bring people out for events, they come for the events, they vote, they walk away. We started to think about how do you get people engaged more longitudinally? How do you look at long-term applications? And so we tried to use our census work to look at cross-sectoral applications of the training apparatus. For example, when we started to recruit people to do the census work, we also met with universities and institutions in the city of Pittsburgh to say, what, was, what would a platform look like if we cross-trained people? Meaning that they got trained to do the census work, use the census activity to train them up for other opportunities, like with PNC Bank, UPMC, and other institutions, so that we create a longitudinal relationship with those individuals and not a transactional one. Secondly, we looked at how do we build the existing infrastructure to ensure the integrity of this work long term. So our partnerships with universities, hospitals, uh, schools, and um, museums, and libraries really went more deeply in how can we use those platforms long term to keep the census work going year round and not just as a result of this one year planning activity. And so our Complete Counts team is behind me. Um, these individuals did a bang up job, and I say bang up in that when they brought the idea to the table, uh, we were very concerned about the transactional nature of it. Um, they went and did significant underground activity, met with people, did a uh, very intensive analysis of what people were saying, brought that information back. We like to use the word we were iterative and agile. Um, we began to pivot and look at where we can put resources at. And as a foundation, as an intermediary, what we try to do is figure out Wherever these hot spots were, we call those hot spots where it was hard to reach people, what was the reason th those people were ignoring or in some way evading the census? Um, and so we really tried to dig into how do we transform people's understanding of why that's important. And so we initiated something called CEPO, Community Based Participatory Research. We also partnered with universities to uh, proffer white papers and briefs around this work to really create a deeper understanding at the community level why it was important and connected to the nonprofits in that area and why it was important for them to maintain data as it connected to the greater system. Um, our work was transformational in that the city of Pittsburgh has 90 communities. Of the 90 communities, there's 43 vulnerable communities with people that are black and brown. Of the 43 vulnerable communities, there's 80,600 vulnerable people. Now get this, of the 80,600 people, there's 46,000 people on probation and parole. Wow, right? How do you transform that in a transactional dynamic? It required a micro, meso, micro systems application, and then we looked at things on the ground, 
We looked at the role of nonprofits. We looked at the role of politics and government. We had to change systems throughout the entire process to create more motivation and inclusion to get people out to vote and to understand what was the underlying reason why they weren't participatory. And so we examined, educated, and engaged similar to what you guys are doing here. Um, but in our engagement process, we sought to create a paradigm shift by which we made more investments in local institutions that really grew their ability to do this long term. Um, our complete counts work looked at a number of measurable outcomes similar to the ones we talked about here. But what's interesting to me is in the 67 counties in Pennsylvania, um, we represent one sixth of that in southwestern PA. We represent a voting block of over 3 million people. And so one of the things I'm responsible for in our core work at the Forbes Funds is I have four core programs that I'm responsible for. The first is Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership, in which we have over 450 nonprofit members. Of the 450 nonprofit members that represent the 10 county area, um, those institutions, a budget range between $50,000 to over $100 million. And so when we pull those institutions together, their voting block capacity is enormous. However, what they're thinking about working on is not always on the same page. And so we've been efforting to create a process by which we put uh, those institutional needs in the buckets and create what we call a local, regional, and national focus of our work within the policy application of those institutions. And so this represented a new project that we're launching and launched actually two years ago called the Leadership Institute so that we ground the work within the organizations long term. And so the Leadership Institute, uh, I think last Thursday I met with the elected officials and launched a new project called the Leadership Institute combined with our catalytic community cohort model in which we're investing $100,000 in every community um, to create this more dynamic engagement process that's based upon create micro, what we call micro ecosystems where one nonprofit is working with a series of partners around a social determinant of health and they're being mentored by a higher performing nonprofit. Within that nonprofit, the Leadership Institute is being galvanized by the interests of the, that typography of that particular community and then using that to create a framework. That framework is created what we're calling a community scorecard based upon the SDGs as well. And so we've taken the social determinants of health. And as you guys know, three weeks ago, the city of Pittsburgh became the second U.S. city to adopt the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Myself and our department has been working with the city for 18 months on that work. And in the past six months, we've worked with Ambassador Mendelssohn to pull together what we call a longitudinal framework for how we implement that work long term within the sector. Um, we stayed understanding the importance of philanthropy or government. As Norman indicated, 10%, uh, 5% reduction costs us hundreds of millions of dollars over a 10 year period. And so, what does that do to the nonprofit perspective and philanthropy? It puts a tremendous strain on, on that institution, which we've had for the last 40 years. Many of you in this room who do this work know that a recession is coming. It's not if, but when. And so our work over the past two years since I've taken over the Forest Funds has really been around scenario planning for nonprofits. And so when we look at this work and the impact of the census work, I think Norman did a great job of exploring that. But we also looked at, when we look at the resource allocation going to development, to market rate, to affordable housing, to mixed income, how are we ensuring that diverse populations are participatory in that process, not in the general sense of getting them a job, but helping them activate their role as a citizen. And we also know that the elderly population um, plays a critical role in this work. And historically, they've been one of the greatest voting blocks in our district. However, as, the, as they've gotten older, they've been um, besieged by a lot of people. Uh, for example, um, there's three epicenters in the city of Pittsburgh right now. And if you guys saw the news two weeks ago, um, we're going to probably become a national icon in a negative way for gentrification. Out of the top 10 cities in the U.S., uh, um, Pittsburgh is eight with the highest rate of gentrification. In my 10 years of being back in Pittsburgh, we've created three epicenters. Um, one is um, East Liberty, 
The other one is downtown, the other one is Lawrenceville. In those three communities, property values have increased in the last 80 months by 217%. And so what we've been doing is looking at stress and shocks to the system with the city of Pittsburgh and the mayor's office, and really looking at the role of how we do smart development. And so next week, I'll be co-chairing a national conference in Pittsburgh called Eco Districts, where we're looking at the ecological framework of the city and figuring out where this ecological footprint is and how we develop sustainable community design principles to mitigate risk. In 2014, when I was at the Kingsley Association, I was responsible for developing an underground process that allowed us to go after a choice neighborhoods award. In 2014, the Alarmer Consensus Group, comprised of 15 community stakeholders, was responsible for launching an effort that resulted in a $30 million choice neighborhoods award. It was the first community in the U.S. that was focused on an African-American-led community uh, approach that looked at sustainable community design. We spun off that activity and used that group to really catalyze how we bring more diverse population to the table. In particular, if you understand what's going on in Pittsburgh, 100 years ago, we provided still munitions to the world. Today, we opened up at Mill 19, the first artificial intelligence and robotic sector. It's a uh, cross-sectoral relationship with universities and corporations. We've made a tremendous leap from an industrial framework, but not from a human framework. As you know, Pittsburgh is designated as one of the 100 resilient cities in the world. Um, as a result of that designation, we represent um, 15 national and 33 international cities with that designation. And Pittsburgh is still a, a, a tale of two cities at this point. And so what we try to do is look at the cross sectoral fragmentation within the sector, mitigate that, and really look at how we create more alignment. And our work has really been over the past, I would say, 16 months within my institution. Our grant making per grant was going to 1.3 organizations. Today it's going to 4.6. So we've increased our grant making by 400%. At the same time, we partnered with the University of Pittsburgh's CRAD Community Research Advisory Board to vet all of our grants. So my personal bias was removed from our grant making. And then lastly, we used the social determinants of health as a framework to align all of our grants. And then finally, um, as we spoke around this room earlier today, my theory of change is no one organization can solve today's social phenomenon. And so our grant requires that you clearly articulate collaborations with organizations that seek to mitigate a particular social issue. A letter of support does not weigh in heavily for us. You have to really show us where the board and institutions impacted by the proposed strategy of collaboration and work exponential growth as a result of that outcome. And so for us, this collaboration is allowing us to explore what's offered in Pittsburgh and its new trajectory. <coughs> Um, the need for cross sectoral activity is critical to our growth and development. If you guys are watching the news, and I keep saying watching the news, two weeks ago, we also made the news for um, our issue of minority uh, fairness and equity and inclusion. Um, there was a, a line that was in uh, the report from the University of Pittsburgh that said, a black woman in the city of Pittsburgh with a child, if she moved to any other place in the country, she would be three times better off than being in the city of Pittsburgh. That shook the foundation world, it shook the corporate world, it shook the governmental agencies, and now everybody's reeling from the report. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do, and the complete counts is critical, because to Norman's point, if you don't get the exact count, you reduce the impact of resources coming to address these known uh, issues within the sector. And so our key collaborations are also working across sectors with universities, philanthropists, <coughs> governmental agencies, institutions. I was one of 450 delegates that just returned from Mexico last week, um, representing uh, uh, Pennsylvania at the Opportunities Collaborative. As a result of that work, we were able to create a new advisory group that looks at affinity work within the states and country in the world. And for us, a lot of the work that I did hear talk about today is that we also have a pressing issue around climate change. And what we propose to do around that work over the next 10 years is we launch uh, 
the 2020-2030 work, which once again will be tied to the census outcomes. And so philanthropy is critical in our work. We look at cross-sectoral work consistently with them. What's the emerging practices in the sector? One Pittsburgh is the mayor's mantra to really pull the city together and create ways that we cross bridges. There's over 2,000 bridges in the city of Pittsburgh, literally. And so we try to figure out how do we cross those bridges and learn new things about each other. And when we talk about micro and micro systems, we're looking at integration points in which we look uh, for sweet spots and where we had the greatest return on investment. And so our work with the C3 has been really around how do we catalyze the community that we already know and intensify its resource allocation based upon strategic uh, resource focuses. And so we've targeted 10 communities to do that work in, just 50 to total targeted communities over the next five years. Uh, those 50 encompass the 43 vulnerable communities I mentioned to you before. And we're excited about this work because it really catalyzes our existing programming, so we're not deviating from that. As a matter of fact, we've optimized that. So from our internal analysis, when I came on board two years ago, we streamlined our internal process to create like a, a linear framework and on ramps for organizations and institutions. And we're currently working on a digital badging program for nonprofit leaders that encompass uh, three phases of uh, professionalism. Uh, one is uh, certification, the other one is credentialization, the other one is uh, CEUs and credits. So we're working with five universities on that partnership as well. I did a 100-day listening tour two years ago and had a thousand face-to-face -face conversations during that time. I heard a lot of things about the city of Pittsburgh from both uh, people on the ground, uh, civic institutions, governmental agencies, and universities. And so we're really trying to look at a holistic response to our effort to support the big counties. And our plan is pretty simple. Um, you know, we're really looking at this notion of we created a project called Piesa, um, and it's really a way of looking at gauging nonprofit strength. Then we looked at um, how we went to those institutions. So we function and do two cohorts uh, pretty much every month. One is a large agency cohort with organizations with $50 million or more that we work with, a uh, consultant that kind of tease out critical issues they're focused on. The other one is small agency cohorts that deal with some things that are on the ground. Um, we do peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, we just had Nora Bates in there from Sweden two weeks ago. Um, she initiated our first warm data labs, and that's been uh, revolutionary. I was very impressed with her work when I talked with her. So when she came in and got on the ground and we identified 20 community leaders to do this work, it really transformed the work. And it basically took the focus of complete counts and integrated it into a grassroots effort to look at how community residents identify with the strengths and weaknesses of the assessment and prioritize those in a way that they can go to the city government and agencies to get support to actualize them from the community standpoint. It really shifted away from a top-down to a bottom-up construct to really create more synergy on the ground that we can work and grow as a result of the community's interest in that work, which ties back to the leadership institutes. And so the fourth one is individual coaching. We've provided coaching to over 300 institutions. And the core work of my, uh, another part of my core work is I do a lot of behind the scenes work with organizations that are floundering or maybe about to go out of business. And so we, and that's private, we don't talk publicly about that work. But over the past 18 months, I've probably worked with eight institutions and some of them are high profile right now. You've heard about the Hill House in the city of Pittsburgh, <coughs> over 100 years old and now it's the bunk. And so we've really been trying to show people that not collaborating, standing on your own in the face of adversity, does have a measurable outcome, it's usually not you winning, it's you losing. And so this complete counts is critical to the sector because if we limit those resources, we put more strain on the systems already limited with its resource allocation. And so our partners are many. Um, I have a core group of partners I work with every day, and then I call secondary and tertiary partners. And basically, uh, when I came on board two years ago, I also created a 200 member cross sector advisory group comprised of 15 subcommittees. Each subcommittee is chaired by two content experts that represent areas I'm not familiar with. For example, nanotechnology, I think it's great. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I see it's the sector that's growing the city. Um, 
my concern as an African American is that as I see the cities far or Phoenix, um, I realize that uh, we continue to provide services and resources to the, uh, those institutions that's ready and agile, those that are not are not part of this ecosystem. And so I turn to brick and mortar. I think bricks are those institutions that are ready and agile. Mortar are the small, small nonprofits that really hold the bricks together. Some of you may never even know who they are. They're the small mom and pop institutions that give out book bags, help kids with after school homework, often paying for that stuff out of their own pockets. Many of you never even see these people, but without them, the bricks will fall. So what we've done is target those in conjunction with creating a mentorship program that links those institutions together so we create one type ecosystem that supports the entire region. Thank you.